If you're driving a car, it's pretty easy to know if there's a bumpy road ahead, because you can see the road and it's bumpy, and sometimes there's a sign that says, hey, the road's bumpy. But what if you're flying a plane? It's not like there's anywhere to plant a sign and rough air moves around. So how do pilots, dispatchers, and air traffic controllers forecast turbulence? And how do they know when to- uh, Attention HI viewers, this is your captain speaking. I'm getting reports of a light infotainment up ahead, so I'm gonna turn on the uh, fasten seatbelt sign and ask you to remain seated for the duration of the video. Turbulence is what happens when funky air currents push on the wings or body of a plane and make it pitch, roll, or yaw. The FAA categorizes it with four intensity levels, light, moderate, severe, and extreme. At cruising levels, there's light turbulence in about 3% of the atmosphere, moderate in about 1%, and severe in a few tenths of a percent. So it's not super common, but it still sucks. From 2009 to 2021, 30 airline passengers and 116 crew members were seriously injured during turbulence, which airlines have to report. They do not have to report the minor injuries and indignities wrought by turbulence, such as, I don't know, spilling your little cup of apple juice on your lap and then having the person next to you point and laugh and say, ha ha, apple juice, just as a hypothetical, not something that happened with this video's writer. Oh, also, turbulence has been estimated to cost airlines up to $500 million a year in damage, delays, and injuries, so bad. There are basically four types of turbulence, wake, mechanical, thermal, and clear air. And even though they're all atmospheric bumpies, they're caused by different stuff, so you need different forecasting methods to avoid each. The first is wake turbulence, which mostly affects planes coming in for a landing. Much like a boat in water, a plane in the air leaves a wake behind it, only instead of swirly water waves, it's swirly air waves, and if you try to water ski in it, you'll die. The bigger the plane, the bigger the wake. It's easy to predict. See a plane, the wake turbulence is behind it. Avoiding it is pretty easy too, since an adjustment of about 50 feet or just over 15 meters is enough to get out of the way. Also, the FAA has separation rules that ensure safe distances between planes, sort of like a restraining order, if it were keeping a plane away from turbulence instead of keeping me away from the Wendover guy's house. Next up, mechanical turbulence, which is caused by stuff. Buildings, mountains, buildings on mountains, all these things obstruct and redirect the wind, creating eddies in the troposphere that shake aircraft like a Polaroid picture. One type of mechanical turbulence is called mountain wave. If you've got decently fast wind moving perpendicular towards a mountain range, it'll bounce off the top and kick up rotors of air way higher than the mountains themselves, sometimes all the way into the jet stream. Sometimes this type of turbulence is actually visible thanks to rotor clouds in the eddies and lenticular clouds over the tops of mountains, but ideally, you know about it before you see it. Long before a flight takes off, atmospheric nerds model where there's most likely going to be a mountain wave and other types of turbulence. NOAA, for example, uses an algorithm called GTG that accounts for everything from wind speed to different structures as eddy dissipation rates to forecast where turbulence might be. Pilots and dispatchers review these models and use them to pick the safest, smoothest flight path ahead of time, hopefully avoiding the turbulence entirely or at least going through as little as possible. Those same mapping and charting tools also help them forecast our third type of turbulence, thermal. Thermal turbulence is the drama queen. She's what happens when warm air meets cool air in the atmosphere, often, though not exclusively, in the context of a thunderstorm. Here we're talking about big vertical columns of air yanking planes up and down, hail, foreboding cumulus clouds, stuff you don't want to fly through. On top of all the forecasting tools used to create the flight path before takeoff, pilots also have some tools to spot thermal turbulence while airborne. Besides the sometimes obvious visual cues, they also get real-time weather information from a radar display in the cockpit. If it's showing precipitation, you can bet there'll be turbulence and they'll try to fly around or over it. If that's not possible because going around would burn too much fuel or the turbulence goes up too high, they'll aim to go through the lightest part. The last type is the strong and silent one, clear air turbulence. It's the most unpredictable of the bunch and 75% of the time it's in literal clear air, meaning it's totally invisible. Clear air turbulence, or CAT as I like to call it, is caused by wind shear, which is what happens when wind meets other wind moving at a super different speed or direction. This often happens around curves in the jet stream and creates patches of turbulence anywhere from 2 to 10,000 feet deep, or about 600 to 3,000 meters. Area-wise, they can be in the range of about Rhode Island to Chad, though usually closer to Rhode Island, and your best tool to spot them is per reps, reports from other pilots. Those can be pretty straightforward. Pilot A tells air traffic control that they went through a cat patch. Air traffic control tells pilot B to navigate around said cat patch, buying pilot B about 20 minutes of adjustment time. There are also automated versions of this process that collect turbulence data from all the planes in the air at once and create a sort of crowdsourced turbulence map. So that's how the people who plan the flights and fly the planes deal with turbulence. But what about you, the anxious passenger? Well, you can learn how to read graphical air mets from NOAA or visit the turbulence forecast before you fly. Or you can just trust the trained professionals operating your flight and the suite of tools they use to forecast and avoid rough skies. But whatever you do, pop a lid on that apple juice. 
Hey, you know what's even rockier and more nausea inducing than turbulence? Choosing a career without the help of this video's sponsor, 80,000 Hours. 80,000 Hours is a completely free nonprofit resource that helps you find a career that's a good fit for you and does good in the world. You're gonna devote 80,000 hours to your career in your lifetime. Spend wisely, that's enough time to do a lot of good. 80,000 Hours will connect you to all the best strategies to spend that time in the best possible way with their podcast, job board, and advising team. For example, if you went away from our recent video about the website where you can order the bubonic plague, kind of worried that there's a website where you can order the bubonic plague. They have articles about how worried you should be that there's a website where you can order the bubonic plague and the fact that there are all these deadly diseases in laboratories around the world, and also how you can use your career to prevent these deadly diseases from leaving laboratories and creating a pandemic. If you're even remotely curious, you've got literally nothing to lose by checking it out since it's all free forever. So if you're ready to make a plan and make a difference, head to 80,000hours.org slash half as interesting where you'll get a free copy of their career guide. You'll be supporting this channel and saving the world when you do, so thanks in advance.